Hello, and thank you for joining this OncLive Peer Exchange entitled Systemic Management of Advanced Soft Tissue Sarcoma. Soft tissue sarcoma is a complex and heterogeneous disease that is often misdiagnosed and difficult to treat. Moreover, until recently, systemic therapies that improve overall survival in patients with unresectable disease were virtually non-existent. In this OncLive Peer Exchange, I am joined by a panel of, ex panel of experts in sarcoma research. Together, we will look at the most recent information surrounding treatment of soft tissue sarcoma and the use of modern therapies in the setting of advanced disease. We'll provide personal perspective on how to apply the latest data to clinical care. I am Dr. William Tapp, medical oncologist and chief of the Sarcoma Medical Oncology Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, New York. Participating today in our distinguished panel are Dr. Kristen Ganju, Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of the Sarcoma Program at Stanford University Medical Center in Stanford, California. Dr. Richard Riedel, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine and member of the Duke Cancer Institute at Duke University School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. We also have Dr. Jonathan Trent, Sarcoma Medical Oncologist and Associate Director for the Clinical Research at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center a part of the University of Miami Health System in Miami, Florida. And Dr. Victor Villalobos, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Director of Sarcoma Medical Oncology and Director of Molecular Oncology Therapeutics at the University of Colorado, Denver. Thank you so much for joining. So let's begin. Dr. Trent, John, do you want to talk to us a little bit about sarcoma to get us started? Yeah, Bill, that's uh, it's a great idea. Sarcoma is a collection of different cancers. In fact, if one were to look in the pathology textbooks, there's over 200 different types of soft tissue sarcomas. Each one of those is a different type of cancer. They're fundamentally different in the way that they present. They're fundamentally different in their metastatic pattern and fundamentally different in the biology as well as the treatment that we're going to hear about today. Yeah. So you can imagine with such a diverse disease, there's a lot of dilemmas, not only that we face at academic centers, but also in the community. So what's some of the diagnostic dilemmas? How do we approach these diseases of, you know, 80 to a few hundred different types of diseases? Kristen? Yeah, one of the uh, most important things is the pathology. So we have to have an expert pathologist who's uh, experienced in sarcomas, as Dr. Um, Trent was saying, 200 different kinds of sarcomas that are so rare that we need to have an expert pathologist uh, subtype the sarcoma. Each subtype is treated differently, so we need to have the um, uh, diagnosis correctly. Uh, the other issue is late diagnosis. So that's one of the reasons, you know, if you don't have an expert pathologist, the diagnosis is sometimes different yeah. than what we have. Yeah, and bumps or lumps are common, right? Yeah. Sarcomas are rare. So how do you work up patients, Victor, when you first see them? What are some of your initial thoughts when you actually... Uh... Yeah, so, you know, diagnosis of these tumors are quite difficult because benign tumors are a hundredfold more common yeah. than malignant ones. So I can't tell you how often we see patients that had a tumor that was growing and then they had a, an oops surgery. Uh, where now we're kind of trying to clean up the problems that are left behind, essentially. So um, I think a good rule of thumb, if it's bigger than a golf ball, it's hurting, or it's growing, don't touch it. Send them to an experienced orthopedic oncologist or a surgical oncologist that, that, that knows what they're doing with sarcomas. And I think that really can uh, mitigate a lot of problems down the road. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's the initial treatment and planning that's going to be really important. And um, what are some of the tests that you would use for these patients, Rich? So I think once you have a confirmed diagnosis, and as Kristen mentioned, uh, the pathology is extremely important, but once a diagnosis is confirmed, you want to understand what the, what the extent of the disease is, uh, and so that would involve staging the patient. So obviously you want to have um, good imaging not only of the primary site, which for a sarcoma that occurs in the extremities is typically an MRI. Mm -hmm. uh, for a sarcoma that occurs in the, in the trunk region, oftentimes CT scan, uh, CT imaging, contrasted uh, imaging is, is uh, enough. Uh, and then you want to image the chest, with the lungs being the most common site of distant spread. Um, the role of PET scan, uh, I, I think, uh, can be debated. Mm -hmm. um, but I think at a minimum, uh, for an extremity sarcoma in particular, MRI and CT scan of the chest. Yeah. And what about things like next generation sequencing? You know, because that's very common in cancer that day. With, with so many different diseases, does it help us? Does it hurt us? What do we use that for? Yeah, I think that's a real good question. And, and it goes back to all the different types of sarcomas. Remember, each one of these is a different type of cancer. 
And in some types, for instance, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, using next-gen sequencing to understand the driver mutation not only helps make the diagnosis, but it helps us subsequently um, understand the natural history and select the appropriate treatment for patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any thoughts? Is that something routinely that you do or routinely recommend for patients, Chris? Um, I've actually been doing um, next generation sequencing for about 80% mm -hmm. of my high grade sarcomas. Mm -hmm. Not the low grades, but the high grades. Mm -hmm. And I have been successful in certain cases yeah. to actually change the diagnosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's an important concept. I mean, I think most of us would say if we see patients coming from outside of a tertiary care center, we often change the diagnosis maybe 15 percent, sometimes higher. Yeah. And, and to us that has meaning because there could be very specific treatments for certain subtypes.